Also ich freue mich erstmal, Sie heute Abend bei einer weiteren Lagebesprechung begrüßen zu dürfen. Äh, mein Name ist Dominik Finkel und ich habe mit Clemens Pornschlegel von der LMU, das steht da drüben am Trickautomat, <lacht> die Lagebesprechung vor einigen Semestern ins Leben gerufen. Und äh, Sie wissen vielleicht, Lagebesprechungen widmen sich Analysen äh, im Kontext zeitgenössischer Theoriebildung an den Schnittstellen von Philosophie, Literatur und Kultur. Und darum soll es eben auch heute Abend gehen. Martin Heidegger steht dabei im Zentrum, der wohl berühmteste, aber auch wahrscheinlich umstrittenste Philosoph der deutschen Nachkriegsgeschichte, wo sein Name fällt, das ist jedenfalls meine Erfahrung, da verändert sich atmosphärisch fast immer die Temperatur. Zumindest ist das meine Erfahrung, sofort steht man mit einem Bein und in der Nazizeit und mit dem anderen irgendwo zwischen Platon und Seinsvergessenheit oder Technikkritik. Heute aber geht es nicht äh, um die Nazizeit und also äh, nicht um die schwarzen Hefte, zumindest nicht in, äh, in erster Linie, sondern eher um ein sehr theoretisches Problem, mit das sich heiliger Zeit seines Lebens beschäftigt hat, nämlich mit der Frage nach der Wahrheit, was ist Wahrheit, wie kann man den Begriff der Wahrheit definieren, aber philosophisch einfangen, das ist natürlich ein zentrales Problem überhaupt der ganzen abendländischen Philosophie. Und ich bin sehr froh, zu diesem Thema zwei tatsächlich international herausragende Philosophen der Gegenwart begrüßen zu dürfen, nämlich Paul Livingston aus den USA und Markus Gabriel. Paul Livingston lehrt an der University of New Mexico in Albuquerque und Markus Gabriel lehrt an der Universität Bonn. Bevor ich Ihnen jedoch die beiden Gäste noch genauer vorstelle, möchte ich noch kurz anmerken, wie der Abend ungefähr aussieht. Frau Livingston wird einen Vortrag von ca. 30 bis 40 Minuten halten, und zwar auf Englisch. Anschließend gibt es ebenfalls auf Englisch ein Gespräch äh, zwischen Markus Gabriel und, und Paul, äh, das Clemens und ich äh, sich ab und zu reinklicken werden. Und in der letzten halben Stunde gibt es dann die Möglichkeit äh, zu fragen aus dem Publikum. Ich werde ungefähr versuchen, gegen 20.30 Uhr wirklich das Ende der Lagebesprechung einzuleiten. Und zwar auch deshalb, weil morgen eine Konferenz stattfindet, nämlich Continental Realism in der Hochschule für Philosophie. Und meine beiden Gäste hatten dort auch ihre Vorträge und ich möchte natürlich, dass die morgen möglichst fit bei der Konferenz dann anwesend sind. Falls Sie Lust haben, auf dieser Konferenz morgen dabei zu sein, die beginnt morgen um 9 Uhr in der Hochschule für Philosophie, Karlsstraße und übermorgen würde ich mich sehr freuen. Es liegen einzelne Flyer aus, oder eventuell kann ich die nachher nach der Veranstaltung noch verteilen. Und ich würde mich freuen, wenn sie noch dazukommen würden. Der Eintritt beträgt 10 Euro. Dort kommen nämlich sehr bekannte Philosophen international, die an zeitgenössischen Debatten der Erkenntnistheorie beteiligt sind. Nämlich neben Paul Livingston und Markus Gabriel auch noch Andrea Kern aus Leipzig. Ray Brassi von der American University in Beirut, Paul Bratton aus Kanada, Anton Koch aus Heidelberg, Dieter Sturmer auch aus Bonn, Peter Bratton aus äh, England, äh, nee, also äh, Ian Brand aus England und Martin Kusch aus Wien. Und Sebastian Rödel aus Leipzig. Ah ja, Entschuldigung, und Sebastian Rödel aus Leipzig, genau. Und ich glaube, die sind auch fast alle schon eingetroffen, es hat keine Absagen gegeben, also das wird morgen ein volles, großartiges Programm. Wie gesagt, die Konferenz beginnt um 9 Uhr. Okay, nun aber zum Thema der Lagebesprechung, eben äh, zu Heidegger. Ich stelle Ihnen kurz Frau Livingston und dann Markus Gabriel vor. Frau Livingston ist Professor für Philosophie an der, wie ich schon sagte, University of New Mexico in Albuquerque in den Vereinigten Staaten. Und seine Arbeit konzentriert sich auf die Philosophie des Geistes. Also gibt es so etwas wie Geist, Bewusstsein, wie kann man das definieren? Philosophie der Sprache, die Phänomenologie und die politische Philosophie. Und er ist besonders, also bin ich international geschätzt, weil er in beiden Bereichen der Philosophie sehr firm ist, nämlich einerseits der analytischen Philosophie und der Kontinentalphilosophie. Und wenn Sie vielleicht ein bisschen Philosophie kennen, dann merken Sie, dass es da so eine Spaltung in der Welt gibt zwischen Anhänger einer kontinentalen Philosophie und einer analytischen. Und sowohl Paul Livingston als auch Markus Gabriel sind, an diesem, sind dabei, diese, diese Kluft zu überwinden. Frau Livingston studierte Philosophie in Harvard und Cambridge und er promovierte an der University of California at Irvine. Er hat viele Bereiche der Philosophie des 20. Jahrhunderts publiziert, 
Und zu seinen jüngsten Publikationen äh, zählen die Monographie The Logic of B, die kann ich mal kurz hochhalten. Das ist sein jüngstes Buch und darum wird es auch heute Abend gehen. Bei Woodledge erschienen, glaube ich, oder? Nee, noch Northwestern. Genau, Northwestern University. Ähm, dann noch ein anderes Buch, das hat er mit einem äh, Andrew Kutrow Fellow äh, herausgegeben, The Problems of Contemporary Philosophy. Äh, das kann ich auch sehr empfehlen. Das ist eine sehr gut geschriebene Einführung in analytische, äh, philosophische Debatten der Gegenwart. Markus Gabriel, den wir schon die meisten von Ihnen kennen, er ist Professor für Epistemologie, moderne und zeitgenössische Philosophie an der Universität Bonn und er gilt als Wegbereiter des sogenannten neuen Realismus, um den es auch zumindest zum Teil auch morgen in der Konferenz gehen wird. Und sein letztes Buch äh, heißt einerseits Field of Sense, das ist die englische Übersetzung von Sinn und Existenz. Andersrum, die deutsche Fassung ist die Selbstübersetzung des von mir geschriebenen Fields of Sense. Achso, ah ja, okay, okay. Und dann noch dein letztes Buch ist, glaube ich, äh, Ich ist nicht gehirn, 2015 erschienen äh, beim Urstadt Verlag. Es sei noch erwähnt, dass Markus Gabriel seit 2012 Direktor des Internationalen Zentrums für Philosophie in Nordrhein-Westfalen ist. So viel zu unseren Gästen und äh, ich freue mich jetzt auf Paul Livingston, der uns auf Englisch das Thema von Wahrheit bei Heidegger einführen wird. Thanks again to you and Mark Paul and Marcus that you have uh, come all this way to be with us today. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. Thanks. Thank you. Let me first uh, warmly thank Professor Dikielda. Um, and also Professor Gabriel, uh, and also everybody who has come tonight. Uh, and let me thank you also uh, for permitting me uh, to speak in English. Uh, so it's, it's easier for me. So um, I've been asked to say something about Heidegger's idea of truth. I thought I might try to talk about some elements of this idea and how it might be useful for philosophical thinking today. In my recent book, The Logic of Being, Realism, Truth, and Time, I try to think about the relationship between truth and time. How what is true, for example, in science, art, or politics, might be thought of as changing over time, as our world and what is meaningful to us changes, while nevertheless still being actually the truth, and not just something to culturally construct or make up. In my argument, I make use of some of Heidegger's ideas, and in particular, how his ideas about truth and time are both related to what he calls being, Dasein, and to our own kind of being and living, what he calls Dasein. But the main point of my argument, I should say, is not to interpret Heidegger overall, or to defend any of his views, but to bring out some basic problems and questions in the context of dialogue with other thinkers and positions, especially in 20th century and contemporary analytic philosophy as well as historical philosophy. So in these remarks, I'll try to outline some of the elements of Heidegger's idea of truth, and suggest how it might contribute to our self-understanding and also our understanding of what happens in domains such as art and science, as well as in relation to philosophical questions. Essentially, I'll argue that Heidegger's idea of truth is important because it brings out the way in which the truth of what we say or judge is itself based on the phenomenon of what appears or shows up as meaningful or significant at different times and in different conditions. As such, Heidegger's idea of truth contains the idea of the sense or meaning that things have for us, and tries to characterize the structure by which they have this sense or meaning. And it does this by relating the truths that we express back to the broad context in which we are able to say them, what Heidegger characterizes as our world, or the world. For a long time, philosophy has thought of truth, or at least the important truths that philosophy cares about, as timeless and unchanging. This way of thinking of tr about truth begins with Parmenides and is captured in Plato's metaphysics of forms or ideas, which are supposed to be incapable of, incapable of change, but nevertheless explain the meaning of things, what, is fun what it fundamentally is for something to be the way that it is. But this is problematic since the significance of things for us changes over time, and our understanding of things changes over historical time to the extent that we may be said to inhabit different worlds that don't contain the same entities or objects. For example, the world of the contemporary quantum physicist, inhabited by quarks, 
neutrinos and wave fields, is very different from the world of the medieval philosopher, inhabited by essences, angels, final causes. If we want to talk about truth, even the truth of the everyday things that we say about the people and things around us, we need to discuss these differences in the ways that phenomena show up, in the ways that things appear, in the meaningfulness of things for us. In other words, we need to talk not only about how things, how, what things are and how they are related, but how the things are meaningfully presented or given for us to begin with. How they, as you might put it, can show themselves in different or varying ways in different total contexts or situations, but nevertheless can still show themselves as they, in fact, actually are. Heidegger works out the tradition of phenomenology, which tries to describe the structure and conditions of the way phenomena, which appear to us, appear with sense, Sin, meaning or significance in each case. These ways are different at different times and for different people and cultures, but that doesn't mean, I'll argue, that truth is just a cultural construction or convention. Instead, I'll argue that the phenomenological conception that Heidegger develops can combine an idea of the way that truths, understood as the ways that entities show up or are available, the way that these change over time, with nevertheless a basic realism about those conditions. How things show up is not just grounded in our own subjective decision or impression, but just as much and as deeply in the way things really are. In order to capture this phenomenological idea of truth, Heidegger uses a few different terms to talk about the ways that things show up or appear. The most general term he uses for the discussion of the phenomenon of truth is, in English, unconcealment, unverborgenheit. This is a translation or near translation of the Greek term, aletheia, which also means bringing out of concealment, obscurity, or hiddenness, the usual Greek term for, for truth. The idea here is not just to talk about discover or discover what things, things, sentences, or ideas are true, but to get at the phenomenon underlying the possibility of truth itself, the more basic phenomenon that must take place in order for us to say that any sentence or any judgment is true or false. For Heidegger, for this to happen, things must first show themselves in some way. That is, something must show up or appear as something or in some way. In Being in Time, he discusses how in a spoken or written assertion about something, uh, we can say something about the entity itself. How the assertion can say something true about something. This depends on the assertion, the expression, being able to show how the entity is actually in itself. That is, how it really is. So for, the, for those of you who have the handout, this is the first uh, quotation for Being in Time. To say that an assertion is true, and here he means a linguistic uh, assertion, signify a sentence as spoken or written, signifies that it uncovers the entity as it is in itself, on themselves. Such an assertion asserts, points out, lets the entity be seen. Here he uses the Greek terminology, apophansis, or showing, or, or uh, showing up. It is uncoveredness, and dectite. The being true, truth of the assertion must be understood as being uncovered, as a second sign. Being true, truth means being uncovered. Better in Deutsch, Farsan, Farhai, Basakt, and second sign. This way, the unconcealment or the uncoveredness of the entity itself is the precondition for saying anything about it, whether true or false. It's only insofar as the entity shows up or appears that we can mean meaningfully say anything about it at all. But that means that. The showing up of the entity, the phenomenon, is an essential part for Heidegger of the phenomenon of truth and essential to the characterization of what truth is. And what we do say about it, the entity, will be true if it is grounded in an uncovering or unconcealment of the entity as it is in itself. In 20th century philosophy, truth has often been understood as primarily the property of sentences or assertions. So, for example, if I say that snow is white is true, a way of analyzing this is to say that it is actually the case that snow is white, that snow has the property of being white. Obviously. One idea that is closely connected with this is that truth is a kind of correspondence or agreement, uber between the sentence or judgment and the way things are in the world. For example, the sun is bigger than the moon, as a mental judgment or, or linguistic proposition, corresponds on this view to the actual relationship between the sun and the moon. The judgment or proposition, the apple is red, corresponds to the actual apple, and is actually being red. This is fine, but in order for the sentence, the sun is bigger than the moon, to be true, we need to be able to understand the meaning of sun 
moon, and bigger than. And to do this, we have to have available to us in some way not only the words, but also what the words stand for. We need some way of having insight into, having access into the things themselves. That is, in this case, the sun, the moon, the relationship of being bigger than. For the sun and the moon, probably every culture and every language has some words in some way of referring to them and picking them out. But the significance or sense of how these phenomena show up can be very different for, at various times. Does the sun appear as a sphere of hydrogen producing energy by means of nuclear fusion? Or as a celestial body revolving daily around the Earth? Or as the wheel of Apollo's chariot? How then should we think about what determines the sense or significance of phenomena as they show up for us? According to Heidegger, this determination always takes place in a broader and total context. That is, in the context of the totality or whole of entities, which is one of the meanings of what he calls a world. When we think about the actual basis for the significant appearance of any entity, we also have to have in mind, at least implicitly, its relationships to all the other entities that surround it and with which we meaningfully engage. This total pattern of relationships is captured in the language that we may speak at a time and goes all the way up to the total context of the world itself. And so for that reason, we have to think about the way that a whole world as a total and holistic context is itself disclosed or made available to us. How truth is grounded, in other words, in our relation to the total context in which we locate ourselves, the world as such. The next quotation from uh, Lecture Course Logic, The Question of Truth, 1925. Truth is not a present relationship between two entities that are present, which is by science for Hansen, for instance, as psychical and physical. It is also no coordination, as one loves to say these days. If it is a relationship, but hasness at all, it is one that has no analogies with any kind of relation between entities. It is, if one can put it this way, the relationship of Dasein as Dasein to its very world. The world openness, that openheit of Dasein, that is itself uncovered. Dasein, who's being toward the world, signs of God, itself is disclosed, aufgeschlossen, in and with this being toward its world. This uncovering is itself grounded, according to Heidegger, in the structure of Dasein as well as that of the world. In particular, uncovering is a way of being for being in the world. What is primarily true, that is, uncovering, is Dasein. Our earlier analysis of the worldhood of the world and of entities within the world has shown that the uncoveredness and dectite of entities within the world is grounded in the world's disclosedness, or schlossenheit. But disclosedness is that basic character, Grundart, of Dasein, according to which it is, it's there. Done. In other words, entities are available to us in the holistic context of the world because we, that is to say Dasein, are able to disclose or uncover this whole context itself through our basic understanding of the ways things are or can be. Heidegger will say that we have a projective understanding of the possibilities of ways of being of entities in the world as a whole. But we are able to do this, the uncovering or discovering of the whole context of the way things are or can be, only because we interpret or understand the sense or significance of what it is to be or exist in some particular way. In that respect, the truth of being is grounded in how we think of entities in general. But it's also, as Heidegger emphasizes, also equally grounded in how they are, that is, their being, or their ontological sense. He uses the terminology, signs in. When something is unconcealed or disclosed as being some way, this means that the sense of its being is also disclosed along with it. This relationship to its being is then captured in the linguistic assertion as well, if it succeeds in capturing the truth. If Heidegger is right, the phenomenon that, that, that is the phenomenon that is ultimately at the basis of the possible possibility of any linguistic predicate being true of its object, as well as any other phenomenon of disclosure, is the phenomenon of unconcealment, itself founded on a what he calls a basic as structure, the structure by which something shows up as something. In a passage from the basic problems of phenomenology, Heidegger specifies how this hermeneutic as, this something as something, something showing up, something appearing, something being disclosed as something, can be understood as the underlying basis for the is of predication. So that when I say the apple is red, this has a deeper basis. The, uh, the copula has a deeper basis in the more basic hermeneutic as structure. And indeed in the being of the things that are thereby disclosed. 
so far as the is in an assertion is understood and spoken. It already signifies intrinsically the being of a being which is asserted about as unveiled, as untuitous. In the uttering of the assertion, that is to say, in the uttering of exhibition, this exhibition as intentionally unveiling compartment expresses itself, speaks to us, about that which, to which it refers. By its essential nature, that which is referred to is unveiled. So far as this unveiling comportment expresses itself about the entity it refers to and determines this being in its being, the unveiledness of that which is spoken of is so co-intended mitgemeint. The moment of unveiledness is implied in, leaked in, the concept of uh, the being, which is meant in the assertion. Das der Aussage gemeinsam sein selbst. When I say A is B, I mean not only the being B of A, but also the being B of A as unveiled. The extant entity, for Handina, is in a certain way true, not as intrinsically extant, but what is uncovered in the assertion. On Heidegger's account, it is therefore the basic way in which an entity and its being uncovered is shown as something that provides the ultimate phenomenological basis for the explicit is of predication. So I say the apple is red, this has a basis in the apple showing itself as red, as being in some way. Or indeed, the inexplicit structure of predication, in no form of the predicative to be is present in the sentence. It is thereby possible to see the predicative structure as phenomenologically grounded in the more basic as structure, which is in a fundamental way not relational or synthetic, but rather just a question of the disclosure, the appearance of the entity, in and in relationship to the total context of entities that surround it and give it a sense. How then do entities first become available to us? And so here we should think about cases where we have not had a term or a phenomenon. Uh, think of the phenomena of contemporary physics, uh, the Higgs boson, for example. This is something that doesn't exist and can't even be referred to 500 years ago. How do they become available? How do entities show up? In the 1928 treatise on the essence of ground, Obeys and Heidegger describes the way in which the availability of entities for reference and description is grounded in the phenomenon of projection, whereby Dasein opens a particular domain for a projective understanding of the being of beings. This, uh, the condition for this opening is found in what Heidegger calls the structural transcendence of Dasein, whereby it is always already outside itself in its original relation to truth as unconcealment. In this sense, according to Heidegger, the availability of any domain of entities is conditioned by a prior interpretation that makes, it, makes accessible a particular domain on the basis of an interpretation itself grounded in Dasein's understanding of being. In this interpretation, new entities may enter the world through sh sudden shifts that allow something of the character of a domain of beings that was hitherto obscure to appear. The phenomenon of world entry is thus to be characterized as a basic possibility of Dasein, insofar as Dasein is world forming, that is structured by a basic transcendence that relates it also to the ontological difference, that is, the difference between entities and being itself. So to summarize, Heidegger thinks of the basic phenomenological condition for the truth of statements or judgments as the prior appearance of entities. This appearance happens in the holistic context of the world and can only happen insofar as we, the beings that he calls Dasein, form a prior or projected interpretation of entities as a whole and as such. Daseinde als solches in Ganzen. He calls this capacity for prior interpretation the capacity of Dasein for world forming or world formation. So, Dasein, the quotation, Dasein transcends means in the essence of its being, it is world forming. Weltbildend, forming, in the multiple senses that it lets world occur, and through the world gives itself an original view, a picture that is not explicitly grasped, yet functions precisely as a paradigmatic form, orbit, for all manifest beings, among which, which each respective Dasein itself belongs. Let's evaluate Dasein itself to code. 
beings such as nature in the broadest sense could in no way become manifest unless they found occasion to enter our world. This is why we speak of their possible and occasional entry into world. Entry into world is not some process that transpires in those beings that enter it. Ein Vorgang, um, ein Gehenden Seinden. But is something that happens with beings. Sondern etwas, das mit dem Seinden geschieht. But what is it to form a world? In the 1930s, Heidegger replaces the earlier conception of truth as grounded in Dasein's transcendence with the diachronic, cross-temporal conception of a plurality of successive historical periods or epochs. The idea here is that in the history of Western philosophy, at least, the interpretation of entities has taken different overall forms at different times. These interpretations take the form of interpretations of what is the highest and most characteristic kind of entity, the kind of entity that is most in, in being, and that it is most stable and enduring. So, for example, in Plato's philosophy, the highest and most characteristic kind of entity is the form or the idea. In Plato's philosophy, the highest, in Aristotle's philosophy, the basis of beings is thought as their substance. In medieval Christian philosophy, God is understood as the summa ends, or highest entity. And in modern philosophy after Descartes, the conscious subject is understood as setting the ultimate standard for what it is for entities to be or to exist. In each of these epochs, the nature of being is determined in a different and specific way. But Heidegger thinks that each such determination is nevertheless a determination of the being of beings. And is grounded also, uh, grounded also in some way in that kind of uh, in that kind of way, in that kind of, in being itself, does sign in the way it shows up or appears, even if in a somewhat veiled or somewhat obscured way in each case. Entschuldigung, die an der Küche, es ist etwas störend. Ich wäre Ihnen dankbar, wenn Sie ein bisschen leiser sein könnten, weil sonst versteht man den Vortrag nicht so gut. Vielen Dank. So, to summarize, and then I briefly finish, Heidegger understands the truth of sentences as always relative to the total context of the possibilities of entities to show up or be unconcealed. And he understands this total context as changing over time in ways that are nevertheless grounded in being itself and our essential relationship to it. Most generally, truth is then the total phenomenon of unconcealment as determining the conditions of how beings show up and also how we can meaningfully deal with and speak of them. These conditions change over time, but also, uh, but always depend on some kind of idea or conception of the overall character or sense of things. Now I'll just say something brief about why truth, if it is understood this way, must also apparently have a logically paradoxical structure and what consequences this might have. This goes beyond the letter of what Heidegger himself says most of the time. But it appears to be, as I argue in the book, implicit in what he says about the structure of truth and the interpretation of beings as such and as a whole. As we've seen for Heidegger, every language and every interpretation of beings so far, at least those that he understands collectively as the history of metaphysics, involves some kind of interpretation of this whole, that is, of the totality of everything that is. This interpretation of the whole is a projection of Dasein's interpretation of the nature of beings, which is ultimately grounded in being itself and our relationship to it. If we think about this totality as everything that can be referred to by means of a given language at a given time, how can we think about the structure and basis for this projection of the totality of entities? One answer, one part of the answer, is that in performing this projection or institution, or this formation of the world as such, Dasein's disclosure of the world must be paradoxical in the sense that it must, take, uh, it must both take place inside and outside the world that is thereby projected and disclosed. Dasein, in one sense, is an entity of being within the world, and at the other, but on the, on the other hand, we project the totality of entities, all of them, as if from a position outside. Dasein is itself an entity. Its self-interpretation, then, is part of the total disclosure of formation, uh, or formation of the world in each case. So if you want to consider the disclosure of entities and the projection of world, that is, the phenomenon of truth, we have to consider this paradoxical structure or status of the basis or institution of sense or meaning. 
We can think about this paradoxical structure by thinking about problems involved in the limits of language, especially when language is used as it must be, to discuss itself. When we consider words like being, meaning, and truth, we have to consider that they are general enough to characterize, in addition to the ph phenomena that they describe, also themselves. So that, for example, if we want to describe the being of everything that there is, we also have to include language itself as something that is. Or if we want to describe the overall structure of truth, we, tr we try to do so by means of a description that, I, that will itself be true. As I argue more fully in the book, the overall structure of truth then has the form of an overall reflexive paradox. A little bit like the paradox of the speaker, who says, everything I say is false. Or like Russell's set theoretical paradox of the set of all sets that are not self-membered. If we understand this in the context of Heidegger's concept of truth, it means that the projective disclosure of world at the basis of truth is possible only insofar as Dasein is itself a paradoxical being, both within and without it, both within and outside the field of truth that it projects. As I argue in the book, a consequence of this is that the overall sense or meaning of things must be undecidable. There is no standard or measure that can ultimately determine meaning overall in an unequivocal and also non-contradictory way. Every time we try to find a standard rule or structure that will determine the sense and meaning of things around us in the language we use overall, we find that the standard cannot decide on its own value or its own sense in a non-contradictory way. What this suggests is that in an important way, it is impossible to determine the meaning of things or the sense of the world overall in a single way. If there isn't any total realm of sense that is consistent in this way, it seems that in an important sense, there is no consistent totality that we can call the world as such. And that means that when we consider our meaningful being in the world, we also have to learn to live with its contradictory structure. But I would argue that this nevertheless doesn't mean that we must or even can avoid understanding our life as just that, a structure of being in the world. Our world always means something involving the overall sense or meaning of things in our relation to it. There may be here a point of discussion with Professor Gabriel who has argued in his excellent book, Fields of Sense, that it is incoherent to suppose that there is the world as a totality of entities, that there is any such thing as the world as the totality of entities. And accordingly, that the sense or meaning of things is always within one of many fields of sense. In this sense, anything that we might characterize as the world is, for Professor Gabriel, as I understand him, necessarily incomplete and does not include everything in any meaningful sense. Though I use some of the same arguments with respect to the world to establish that the world is either incomplete or inconsistent, I try in the book to explore some of the consequences of the latter option, namely that there is a totality of entities. However, every stabilization of total sense is itself foundationally inconsistent, and thus bears within itself the possibility of its transformation into something else. As I suggest, this possibility goes as far as the possible transformation of what Wittgenstein called our collective forms of life, Lebensform. That is, the dominant modes of organizing life, activity, and social and technological practice. But it also suggests a different way in which our practices are as such, always situated within and subject to the problems, paradoxes, and aporias of these forms. Wir steigen gleich ein, weil die eine Frage ging ja schon direkt an dich und dann. Wir haben leider nur ein Mikrofon, das heißt, wir müssen ein bisschen darauf achten, dass wir gegenseitig uns die Mikrofone dann reichen. Okay, los geht's. Well, I probably better speak in English, right? Then, then everyone is on the same page, unless you, you're totally fine with German. Then, I don't know. Yeah. What do people think of the room? You understand? English, English is better, auch für ihn und damit wir eine Sprache haben. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Until until a couple of years ago, it used to be a language of emancipation. Now I feel bad speaking English, but okay. So uh, um, it's a shame. Well, okay. Be that as it may. So now we're doing this in English, and also in Heidegger context, you shouldn't, you know, like it's in Heidegger context. Don't say that German is a better 
philosophical language and has certain consequences. Okay, that's as <laughs> much as I want to say about the propaganda aspect of Heidegger, but it will probably come back in one way or another. So let me just say a few words. I mean, there are so many points uh, that we have in common, you know, like in the book, and we've, all, all, you know, this goes back to earlier conversations we had, and Paul was nice enough to come to Bonn when I had the manuscript down of Fields of Sense, and we discussed it in detail, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So the, there's a, there's a lot of common ground, but I want everyone. Uh, roughly on the same page, and then you see where we part ways maybe. So it's not like superficially, obviously, where uh, um, what we say is clearly incompatible on, on various interesting levels. So these are alternatives to deal with a very similar problem. But, you know, like often in philosophy, when things look superficially contradictory, they might not be, right? I mean, so let's see where this where the conversation leads us. But yeah, so let me just first try to highlight right, the possible disagreement um, uh, because this uh, makes things more interesting in this kind of setting rather than trying to agree with you or, or give you a version of what I say that uh, um, <coughs> looks like less in disagreement with your proposal. Okay, um, so I, I will not say a lot. We might come back to this, uh, to the reading of Heidegger. So I don't think Heidegger is a realist. It's, it's, so just a few words. I think he's an anti-realist on all interesting issues. And uh, but he's trying to be a realist for the reasons that he work out. That's why I think that uh, Heidegger's Heidegger's thought is profoundly incoherent, uh, not inconsistent in some acceptable way. It's just incoherent. He doesn't get his act together uh, on like no level. Um, but that also makes him interesting, and, and, and I think what you say about Heidegger, your reading of Heidegger, is a very interesting proposal standing on its own. So I want to uh, engage the, this, this line of thought. Um, so yeah, clearly I would want to say there's no being in the world. There, when I say the world doesn't uh, exist, you know, I'm not kidding. Uh, so I think there's, uh, uh, there's no, as you nicely put it, there's minim so the minimal thesis that I would like to defend is that there's no interesting thing in which there is something like a totality of beings, totality of fact, or totality of whatever. There's no interesting metaphysical sense. At most, it would be technical to show why this doesn't even hold, but okay, so for the metaphysicians in the room, at most, I give you the a boring universal quantifier. Talk about everything, all right, but at most, it's boring, okay? Uh, that's, that's all I can give you. Roughly the idea is this, right? If you talk about absolutely everything, yeah. Also, uh, when Heidegger talks about das Sein den Ganzen, or the world, which is crucial yeah, um, for Heidegger, um, he wants to say something more meaningful, right? I mean, everything, something along the lines of, you know, everything is water. That would be surprising, right? You thought there was like Munich and Donald Trump and uh, Intifada and stuff like that, but it turns out everything's water. That would be surprising, right? That's surprising metaphysics. And then the next guy around the corner will say, no, there's also fire, earth, and air, and then you know, they start having a debate, and that's the history of metaphysics. And I think everyone in the history of metaphysics was wrong. Okay, so this entire history is just a history of uh, provable mistakes. Okay? Uh, uh, um, however, right, there are interesting ways of trying to fix the problems. Once we have the logical tools of the 19th and uh, 20th centuries, of which Paul makes uh, very interesting use uh, in his work, we can try to fix that. Um, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's hopeless uh, to try to fix that. This is where the disagreement lies. So I think we just have to give up on the idea that uh, uh, either metaphysically there is a totality, regardless of the human being's presence in the cosmos, uh, or with the human uh, presence in the cosmos. I think neither with nor without the human presence things form a totality of any kind. Uh, that's, that's the claim for which I have worked out arguments, uh, which draw on some insights of Heidegger's uh, too, in a different way. So this is where clearly the disagreement is. Um, uh, um, and I would, uh, this is why also I would claim that, I mean, this has consequences for what you say at the end of your talk, right? So how do we think a, a change in world, now in, in, in this language, right? Your proposal, I think, is roughly Hegelian, yeah. So a total, uh, uh, any, any totalizing view uh, will reveal sooner or later an inconsistency. And a rational way of dealing with uh, such an inconsistency, or in any event an inevitable one, will be to try to fix that, right? This is how I read Hegelian dialectics. 
both in the phenomenology of spirit and the logic and also in the encyclopedia. So there's a, there's a contradictory overgeneralization, you know, uh, everything's water, and the next guy around the corner will say, no, not everything is water, right? My thought that everything is water isn't water, and you know, stuff like that, and then philosophy gets going, and, uh, and everyone is trying to fix the uh, closure paradoxes of the ancestor view. And I think this is uh, Hegelian dialectics. Um, and uh, uh, this has, of course, very interesting ramifications. Uh, what, what I would want to process, uh, propose is a, is a very different way of looking at the history of metaphysics. Uh, I think the world, as I put it in the German version of uh, Fields of Sense, is a source of nonsense, Unsinnsquelle. Uh, um, so I think that whenever you try uh, to say what absolutely everything has in common such that it gives you a sense in which these things are, Whenever you give an answer to the provide an answer to the question, what is it that Angela Merkel, pubic hair, the Intifada, Donald Trump, and the number seven have in common? So that they all are, right? They seem to have something in common. And I think any possible response that you're trying to give to this, at best, that's the view, right? At best boils down to something boring, right? Uh, but I, I think that even that doesn't work out. So like, yeah, if, even if you try to be like, oh, no, no, this is just a logical claim about universal quantifiers. But the association, the yeah. association of Angela Merkel and pubic hair is not boring. Yeah, 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 that's, yeah, that's why it wasn't a metaphysical claim, right? It would be, the, the metaphysician makes uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the co-presence of Angela Merkel and pubic hair in Berlin, uh, generally, I'm not talking about her pubic hair, I'm, you know, like the German public, the, you know, like, I work for the government, I don't criticize it, blah, blah, blah. Uh, okay, uh, be that as it may, right? Uh, so the co-presence of these kinds of entities at the city of Berlin, uh, the metaphysician will say, oh yeah, don't worry, I mean, what they have in common is, for instance, they, they have just both been mentioned, right? That's, uh, uh, that's Gegenstands theory, uh, re uh, currently represented, I think, in the most sophisticated form by our common friend, Graham Priest, theory of objects. Oh, they're both objects, and now you ask uh, him, you know, well, what's an object? Well, whatever I can mention, I just mentioned that, right? Now, look what this gives you. This gives you a worldview of the following form, right? Had no one ever mentioned anything, there wouldn't have been any objects. Now, that's not a good view, right? That means that human beings, by mentioning stuff, turn everything into existence. So you have to be a realist about that. I mean, this is where I think we both start. So how can you be a realist and hold interesting metaphysical views? And generally, let me just give you roughly my argument and then we engage in the debate, right? Um, so my kind of argument has the following form, right? So, um, uh, um, so here's my account of world entry, which isn't quite world entry, of entry. So here's my account of entry. Uh, so what enters Munich okay, is subject to all sorts of, uh, in, because it's a city meaningfully articulated um, you know, standards. Uh, uh, um, how do you get into Munich? Well, you can be a building in Munich. The buildings of the Ludwig Maximilian University are also part of Munich. You can be a building in Munich, but then you're subject to certain laws, right? You can be traveling through Munich, etc. There are there are different ways of making an appearance in Munich. And when you make an appearance in Munich, I say that you exist. When the number seven makes an appearance in the series of natural numbers, it exists. But, uh, but the sense in which something can make an appearance in Munich and the sense in which uh, the number seven can make an appearance in series of natural numbers are clearly not the same sense. Okay. And I think if there were such a thing as a totality, there would have to be a, a, an overall entry point and I think that problem cannot be fixed. Okay. So what I'm saying is the co-presence of pubic hair and Angela Merkel is in, in Berlin is not subject to an overall metaphysical rule. They hang together in various ways, these two kinds of objects, yeah. but not because for them to exist is something generally accessible. This gives me critical tools, so let me stop at there. So we, we, we probably have common enemies, that's why we both have flirtations with Heidegger, such as bad forms of naturalism. Yeah. So for something to exist, and this is clearly where I think we both disagree with Graham Priest too, for something to exist is not for it to be part of the causal web of the universe. Yeah. Uh, um, so that's out of the question. Yeah. For me that's a priori, right? Naturalism is false a priori because it's a view about everything. I don't have to do 
much more work to show that it's not the case that futuristic unified physics, whatever that would be, knows everything there is to know. Uh, this is hopeless. Uh, uh, but equally solipsistic subjective idealism would be hopeless, something of the form, right? If you could only call God, uh, then he would know what is the case. Don't call the futuristic physicist, also he doesn't, she doesn't exist, but maybe God, also she doesn't exist, but okay, so but people have thought she does, and she did, and so you could call up her. And I think if you call it, you know, like even a direct landline to God wouldn't help you in metaphysics, I think. Yeah. I think God is, uh, uh, as a subject, in, in, uh, just in a different, had she existed, she would have been in a different position from ours, but in no better position. Uh, um, I think God, metaphysics, metaphysically, is no better off than any other earth form. Uh, th these are consequences of all, all of this. And um, so in one word, yeah, this is, this is the most profound disagreement with Heidegger. Uh, we are just, no one is Weltbild. Uh, um, and uh, so I think Heidegger's entire anthropology, yeah, he doesn't want to call it an anthropology, he's always funky with his terms, whatever, it's just an anthropology, he just calls it by the, a different name. Uh, but I think his entire anthropology is fundamentally flawed, which is what he realizes at some point too, right? Uh, when he starts criticizing the Weltbilder. So this is another tension in Heidegger's view. But that, that would be Heidegger, so I, I really... Uh, so, but that's roughly what's going on. And, uh, um, but deep down, I mean, uh, deep down there are of course logical issues to be settled, which make, the, make a superficial appearance here maybe, but let's see. So that's, uh, I, I, hope there's, I hope there's a way in which you can grasp what might be at stake uh, if I put it in this way after Paul's very clear exposition of history. Great. Uh, great, thanks so much. Um, yeah, so I have, I have a lot. Um, I'll, try, I'll try not to say too much. <laughs> um, but so I think first of all, I, I would say um, I agree with you know, the overall characterization that, you, that Heidegger is not a realist. Um, and, uh, but as you also said, he's, that he's trying to be, he doesn't get it together. Um, and so what I tried to draw in the book is actually not uh, a detailed exegesis of Heidegger's position or you know, what does he say about uh, the dependence of truth on, on, on Dasein uh, in particular, but rather the relationship that he also sometimes, sometimes suggests, uh, more basic, I think, in a, in a certain way, uh, between truth and the ontological difference uh, between truth being entities. Um, so I basically restrict myself uh, methodologically to the question of what, what significance does the ontological difference, that difference between being itself and, uh, and entities, things that are, uh, have for the question of the overall, overall structure of, of truth. Um, and uh, so, okay, so, so, so that's that. I mean, I, I think I, um, I, I agree also very much with um, the characterization of where the, uh, the differences uh, are. Um, but uh, with respect to uh, you know what, uh, between us, but with respect to uh, the um, the what the various thing, things and phenomena that Heidegger associates with with world, um, and here I want to I would like to nuance also my starting point uh, a bit as well um, in in the book is is really not uh, a project it's not conceived as a project of metaphysics in the traditional sense of description of the, uh, of the totality of entities or characterization of the totality of entities, nor in, in just an interpretation of the quantum, of the, the quantum wires. Um, so rather, um, I actually, and especially the resources that I draw from uh, analytic philosophy, um, I'm interested in, you know, in the structure of, of a language um, over, at, at a time. And this is, you know, as I sort of tried to, um, Try to emphasize, I think Heidegger is interested in this as well, in the fact that languages do change. And as languages change, they uh, allow for different sorts of, fundamentally different sorts of, sorts of entities uh, to show up, to dis be disclosed, to, to appear. Um, and so at, on one level, I think I, I take Heidegger's project, or it can be read in any case, as almost a, you know, as a project actually rather in philosophy of language or semantics. Uh, rather than uh, simply metaphysics uh, in this kind of you know uh, sort of sense, uh, and then so I guess I would pose back you know the question okay so you know metaphysically or on, on metaphysical grounds I think essentially you're denying the existence of the world that is to say there is no uh, being in the world there is no Dasein and uh, uh, there are all these you know all, all these uh, phenomena that, that Heidegger associates with with, uh, with world don't occur uh, for you. Uh, but so uh, I would ask then about some, you know, not just simply the question of the metaphysical totality of entities, 
But I would ask about the question of the totality of what a language can do at a, at a time. And so here, uh, Priest's reference to, you know, to uh, whatever I can make mention or make reference to is actually, is actually useful because we have, we have logical tools, the semantic tools for studying the structure of a language overall uh, with respect to, uh, you know, to the totality of its reference. And we know that that, that, that changes over time. Um, and we have, you know, there we have tools that are both linguistic, derived from linguistics, um, and you know, perhaps empirical uh, you know, psychology, but also, also from formalizations um, such as, for example, as I draw in the book, uh, Tarski's formalization of, of the structure of truth, the truth predicate for a, for a, for a language. Um, and so, I, so I, guess I, you know, I, I guess I would pose the question, well, can you then characterize uh, this kind of shift, maybe broadly shifts in meaning, shifts in significance, and more broadly in terms of in terms of your uh, overall view, your no world view. Uh, well, we have these, these plural fields of, of, of sex, right? But can you uh, characterize the, the the genesis, the institution, the constitution of of, of the fields of sex? Um, and you know, what what relationship does that have to uh, the uh, questions in philosophy of language and, and, and formal semantics. And that's where I, I kind of, I just want to point out, you know, and again, I mean, I think there are, um, the, the arguments that I use for, in, in thinking about um, the, this totality, the, you know, beings as a whole and as such, um, are very similar to the arguments that, that you use. Um, right, but whenever we have an antinomy or a paradox, right, we can draw two conclusions, either that, uh, about the totality of the world, either that that totality does not exist or that it exists inconsistently. And if we have good reason to think that um, that our language already commits us to its existence, then it's at least worth exploring the second route. I don't say that there's any kind of knockdown argument or overall kind of uh, you know uh, conception that forces it, right? But I think we do talk about, for example, truth. Um, we do talk about being, right? Um, and this is part of our language, and our language has that structure. Uh, of, of totalizing in and of itself. Yeah. I, I also have a question for, for both of you because I mean, you you give rather very favorite interpretation of unconcealed yeah. as a concept, yeah. and I would like to know from you, Marcus. Can you? How's your relation? Do you do you do you, do you think the concept makes sense, or is it mystical? Uh, it, it refers a little bit to your question: how to deal with dialectic dialectics right. within the theory of fields of sense. Because, I mean, it, it, it is a dialectical theory that it's like a, like a Möbius slip or a Gestalt switch. The truth has something, has something to do with that. And I think that's also the, your yeah. question. How do you deal with these kinds of experiences of, uh, of, of truth, of truth as unconcealed? Well, these are, I mean, it's clearly not a coincidence that I will begin my talk tomorrow by, with a denial of the existence of language. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, there's uh, there's no such thing as English or German or the or a culture. Yeah. So of course this is, but I have to. So this is just this is just spelling out a consequence, right? I mean, so uh, I think I think you're you know pointing your finger on exactly the right spot. So that's uh, so this is where you know a, a second you know like bout of the action will take place. So totally you know like so I think this is. A very important uh, point. So I have to say this. Yeah. Can, My you way, can you repeat the spot for the audience? Again? Okay. So the idea is this, right? So imagine you could say something like, "Look, there's a language, right? Say, say German or physics or whatever, right? So, so imagine you think of a language, and and you fix the meaning of the word language with the help of linguistics, say, right? I mean, that was your proposal, and you also were like open-minded or psychology or whatever, right? So or semantics. So you know, like you go Berkeley. Uh, you go to Berkeley and you talk to like Davidson and Tarski and so on, and and they have interesting ways of trying to do this, right? Um, uh, or MIT or whatever, right? So there are projects which try to deal with uh, this, right? And of course, I have to think that these projects are failures. And fundamentally, I think that um, you know, like what that means is, I think I think the reality of speaking uh, um, is studied by, say, linguistics. And I think it's, the, it's a property of every model. Linguistics has a model, right? Linguistics is not just more language. There are paradoxes, right? Linguistics creates new sentences. Um, so every sentence of linguistics, the discipline, uh, that's something we know from linguistics, 
linguistics is very likely never had to have occurred before. Right? So many that we know from Chomsky that most of the sentences that Chomsky writes down are sentences that no one ever mentioned before. So that's 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 an occasion for that triggers paradoxes. Two interesting paradoxes of this form. But so let's imagine. But uh, let's uh, yeah, so abstract from this and idealize away from this problem and say, look, okay, that's that's a problem. But imagine we have fixed it in some way or other, and then we have linguistics for English, say. And I think what's going to happen always is that, at best, uh, we get a glimpse of uh, uh, paradigmatic samples. So you come up with samples and say, look, this is the language, right? So the, uh, this is paradigmatic. Typically, philosophers' cases, right? Atomic propositions, the cat is on the mat, and so on, right? The philosophers' examples and linguistics' examples are not typically the tough ones, right? The example is not usually T.S. Eliot and then just, you know, a, a whole poem, but at most like a line from it. Uh, time passed, what does he mean by that? Or whatever. So, and I think that the reality of language is such, it has the logical shape of my model. So I also offer a model. Like, I don't want to say that all oh, these people, they all have models. I take off the glasses and now I'm the only realist in the room. That would be a bad view too, right? Uh, um, uh, uh, that would be speculative realism. Um, so that's not what I'm doing. Just take off the glasses and be done with models. Uh, uh, don't do theory construction. Uh, oh, oh, oh. That, that's not the way to do it. Yeah. And we totally agree on that. So I also have a model. So I have to establish that my model has certain virtues that other models might not have, right? And here the virtue is that my verdict is going to be language is going to be always more complicated, actual language, than any linguistics ever. Uh, so I think linguistics is running always behind language. Uh, so a language is always where linguistics has not yet been. Uh, and that's constitutive of linguistics. I think this is good news for linguistics, like with physics, right? Uh, uh, the universe is always where physics hasn't been yet. Otherwise, it would also not just not be an empirical science. That, that's also the virtues that I would associate with my claim. But yeah, so in a similar tone of voice in which I say the world does not exist, I will also add further uh, uh, statements of the form. Language doesn't exist, culture doesn't exist, the people doesn't exist, the government doesn't exist, society doesn't exist. So yeah, uh, 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 because all these totality words, you know, I have to get rid of them for logical reasons. So that's... Uh, oh yeah, unconsciamo. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a tough one because now we might have to talk about Heidegger. I think so. Here's, I think, the reasonable bit that I associate with the unconcealedness stuff from phenomenology. So, here's, I think, where something reasonable is going on. I need a notion of reference. So, it's, so imagine, imagine I have a, you know, like Heidegger is doing logics, and I think that's good, right? So, and Heidegger realizes that uh, you, you can't be an inferentialist. Heidegger knows, uh, like any good logician, that Brandon is false a priori. Uh, so Brandon is an inferentialist, he thinks that the meaning of terms in the syllogism is fixed by the form of the syllogism, right? So if you think, for instance, all men are mortal, Socrates is mortal, therefore Socrates, uh, uh, sorry, all, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal, whatever, right? So over complex syllogisms, uh, when you run through your syllogism, the meaning, uh, he thinks that, really, it's that crazy, the view, the meaning of Socrates is fixed by the position that the term Socrates occupies in all valid inferences. Uh, uh, so he does, uh, he, he gives truth and reference away, explicitly so. Uh, now I think that's exactly not Heidegger. I think Heidegger and Husserl, they want to say, no, no, you can't, uh, uh, the very idea of logical validity is a function of your prior grasp of meaning uh, in your term. And any prior grasp of meaning is going to be one of reference. But reference is not, as Heidegger says, uh, um, a bridge uh, between land and sea, as he wants, uh, as he calls it. Uh, so there's no, uh, that's not what reference is, something in my mind and stuff out there. And then we need a bridge between the real and the ideal or whatever. That's just ridiculous. Heidegger, Heidegger I think, is a direct realist about reference. This is where the realism is. Yeah. But he's not a realist about truth. That's the crazy bit. So given that Heidegger is a direct realist about reference, uh, when it comes to complex thought, propositions, inferences, there he's an anti-realist. That's, that's the vibe that Brandon picks up from Heidegger. And I think that's deeply incoherent. And I think the same happens to Husserl. I think that's, that's a good definition of phenomenology. They have a good notion of reference and a terrible logic. Yeah. Not you, because you're not a phenomenologist, but I think. Yeah. Right. 
I, mean, I guess I would, I would just then ask, you know, you have, so you, you say you have a model, the model is not uh, a model of uh, any of these general, you know, general, generalizing words. Uh, I guess I would ask how you distinguish the, the, the general things that you want to, that you don't model from the things that you can model. Yeah. And, you know, even these, 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 these statements of generality, language does not exist, uh, you know, the, the world does not exist, right? Um, they're, they're puzzling because they appear to be themselves meaningful, meaningful yeah. statements, yeah? yeah. Um, and so I, I think, you know, so again, we have options. Uh, my point is only that we have options, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. We, can make this, we can make this denial, but we can also uh, understand to some extent the structure of these uh, apparently, you know, uh, ultimately paradoxical, ultimately reflexive. Uh, yeah. Uh, problems and uh, the suggestion was just that yeah that again it's not necessarily high degree it's not the bridge yeah. between between no, 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 planet no. and, 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 and C, uh, but rather that uh, that we we can see the phenomenon that he's calling a concealment uh, in in in, the, in terms of this structure of, of paradox and so then I, I still ask I mean I think I return to this question of you know for you uh, with your model if it is a model of, of fields of sense right uh, what can we say about how these are are Constituted, how there is. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me say yeah, something about this. Yeah, this, uh, this is the dialectics and gender question yeah. that I get all the time. Not necessarily. I, I don't read them as dialectical. No, no, not at sense. all. No, no, of course not. No, no, not clearly not in that sense. Your, your model of transformation, I think, is one which draws on Heidegger and this. Yeah, yeah, that's very. Different. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Uh, and uh, uh, I know lots of people. Some of them recently died, and some of them are still alive, who were actually slapped by Heidegger because they said that uh, there's dialectics in Heidegger, yeah. and Heidegger would slap you for this one. Uh, yeah. uh, Werner Weyerwalds, for instance, was slapped, and uh, Rüdiger Buchner, uh, Gadamer, and Fulda, those are the four people who told me the same story, when they said, this is dialectics, boom. Uh, and uh, Fulda wants to ask him, well, I agree with all the things that you say about time, and being in time, but still, I have a watch, there's physical time, my friend. Uh, and then Heidegger said, uh, he's reported to have said, this is not Heidegger's question. Dies ist Heidegger's Frage nicht. To which Fulda replied, that's correct, it's Fulda's question. <laughs> okay, but, okay uh, but he didn't get an answer, unfortunately. So we don't know what he would have said about this. Okay, so, um, but, okay, so what about this? Uh, 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 so I think that some fields of sense are eternal. Um, I'm a place in this about numbers and so on. So uh, some are eternal, some are genetic. Now, can I answer from, the, from the, the standpoint of philosophy, can I answer the question, what is the genesis of a field of sense? Well, clearly not in general, right? Uh, but also like locally, no, I think these are straightforwardly empirical questions. Uh, uh, so I think that what's the genesis of the field of sense of Munich? Well, what, what the heck do I know? Right? I mean, uh, uh, what the Bavarians are after, right? I mean, uh, uh, um, and how this came to be. I, I, I think this is such a complex field of sense that it's pretty close to impossible to like ever understand how that, you know, like this is just way too complex an object. And let alone, so I think these, the, uh, I think these are like really empirical questions, but, uh, but in a complicated sense. Empirical now must not mean like ask your favorite sociologist because, because I think that many disciplines that call themselves empir empirical are metaphysical. Uh, I think huge chunks of theoretical physics is basically a priori metaphysics, but it looks empirical because, uh, because uh, some of the terms in the model are guaranteed to refer because they're measurements. Uh, I think big chunks of contemporary theoretical physics are mix, mixed back. Uh, they're not as empirical as they ought to be. Uh, uh, yeah. So to say something maybe provocative, but not that provocative in these uh, blocks here, there's some sense in which I might be a logical positivist. I don't know if this matters, but uh, uh, maybe Hannes Leipzig would be happy to hear that there's another logical positivist. Yeah. So, I mean, again, I, then I would just, I guess, um, point out or suggest that uh, you, because you don't characterize uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, you don't give an account of, of the genesis or institution of, of fields of sense or of sense as a whole, you also can't give an account of the transformation of sense yes. as, as a whole. No, not um, as a whole. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, in terms of uh, the kinds of things that people um, uh, occasionally, you know, like, like how you have called world transformation or uh, you know, radical uh, shift, even in the political domain as well, yeah. because oh, I think yeah. this, no, is, this is, you know, uh, important. I mean, I mean, one way of thinking about the potentiality of of revolution or political transformation is as this complete shift in meaning, but that's not, exactly. accept, that's not accessible to you. Yes, exactly, yeah, yeah. No, that's, uh, I think part of, part of this project is profoundly political, 
Now, of course, I mean, this is where this is also where the minds meet here, right? So I would want to say this is the wrong model for revolution. Uh, this is exactly the model for revolution that is so well understood by those who do not want any revolution that it's completely under control. If this is the model of revolution, there's not going to be one. Which model yeah. are you talking about? Uh, well, the, the idea of total transformation. This is clearly Heidegger's model of revolution, right? Heidegger clearly thinks that with the, uh, with the National Socialists, there's a, there's a profound shift in the meaning of being. That's what he... That's what it but you. Yeah, or Shishak and Padu, etc., etc. That's roughly the same kind of view. I think this is profoundly misguided. Uh, um, however, I have a, a, a kind of substitute for this, right? But this comes from a totally different direction. So here's the substitute version of it, uh, uh, which, uh, which is, you know, like that, that's uh, okay. Um, ideology happens. Uh, so something that ought not be the case. So when I say ideology, I don't use it as a neutral term, okay? I think of a kind of uh, fairly large-scale uh, self-illusion uh, of agents when I talk about ideology. False consciousness. False. Uh, not like a little bit correct, but just false consciousness. Okay. Now, false consciousness comes uh, is a function, I think, of worldviews. Uh, so I think ideology is exactly the thought that they're worldviews. And competing ideologies, right, Weltanschauung, as they said in the Weimar Republic, uh, using the term, uh, term coined by Kant in the, the Third Critique, Weltanschauung, uh, uh, worldviews, uh, as they combat each other, Weimar Republic style, etc., are really just clashes of ideology, one mistake next to the other. And I think that this, this will be my diagnosis of the political situation, die geistige Lage unserer Zeit. I think what's happening is exactly uh, this, that uh, um, those who resist uh, um, welcome change in light of obvious moral ideas of equality and freedom, okay? Those who do evil uh, know this, and they sell worldviews. I think we're in an era of, of the explicit production of worldviews. So we are up against metaphysics once again, but this time it has yellow hair. Uh, and not just yellow hair, right? It comes Maoist, Maoist ideology, etc., etc. So this is, uh, this is like pretty much omnipresent. Uh, 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 that's, that's part of why I think, the, again, saying what the possible virtue of the model is, right? So this was not just a first order political view, I'm trying to draw consequences of the model. So, yeah, I mean, let me say, I, I would agree with that completely um, as a description of ideology and as a description of the current situation. Um, and so part of the problem, and this is really a question for me, um, is, you know, very clearly it is not a question uh, today of uh, let's institute a new worldview. Let's yeah, transform exactly. our worldview into something, into something, something else. else. Uh, it cannot be. And uh, the, significant, you know, the significance of this, what I really want to want to draw out, is not uh, that kind of that kind of call for more worldview philosophy or something like that, but rather the recognition that every worldview, every ideology, is at bottom formally inconsistent. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And there we agree. There, there, there yeah, we totally. Agree. No. Uh, and that means unstable. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and also that, that there is, I mean, insofar as there is a politics here for me, yeah. uh, it is a critical politics. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, only a critical politics. Very clear. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah. I just have much less um, hope in the transformation there, right? So I think the transformation is not coming from within in this way, right? So, I mean, uh, uh, your prediction, uh, your, I mean, we can try to make predictions in interesting ways, right? I mean, so our models are testable empirically in a certain sense, right? I mean, if your prediction is right, um, uh, the kind of predict, then uh, uh, inherent, so a transformation can be an inherent transformation. Uh, and I think it cannot be an inherent transformation in the same way. I think I can, I, I think it's unfortunately totally stable logically, right? To think of an eternal, continuation of just one stupid ideology, like North Korea forever or whatever, right? So uh, it, it would just be terrible and inconsistent. Uh, but Kim Jong-un doesn't care, right? Of course it's consistent, so what? Uh, 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 you know, yeah, there are concentration camps, so what? Uh, that, that's exactly the point there. Uh, so, but it would be great if dialectics uh, would turn out correct. That would be great. I have, I have a last uh, theoretical question for, for both of you, and I, I think then we open up the debate to the audience. Uh, you focused on your book, but also on your talk, on the, the paradox of self-enclosure. And uh, I think this is a very interesting thought and in concept in Heidegger. I think that's, that's his idea also in 
Pontisch ontologische Differenz, that every time that when the mind re reaches out to the, out to the world, it is in the paradoxical structure of self enclosure. Yeah. And uh, in that sense, I don't see him as a totalitarian thinker, even if he has, of course, when he talks about faith, you know, what you mentioned several times, uh, that he has nevertheless an idea that, uh, that there's a world out there, or at least a meta structure that we have to refer to. But I think his main idea is this paradox of self-enclosure, and that's why he referred to Russell and all these paradoxes. Uh, so I wonder a little bit, how can you deal with your, your theory of fields of sense? Uh, is are these field uh, theories of fields of sense, are they, are, are they touched by it? Or, because sometimes it, uh, it, it appears that, uh, that we are very at home in these fields of sense, and, we, and where you don't uh, define, at least as far as I can judge, uh, the paradox of that every field of sentence opens up. It's a little bit of a question to you, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, not only are we, and we are beings in the world, um, and this is important, right? Um, insofar as it's meaningful at all to talk about beings in the world, and of course, no, I say no. But, uh, but and, and also, when we think about the resources of our language, when we think about the resources of our uh, internal you know, conception or consideration of truth, language, and meaning, right? These are, these are formally, you know things that are marked by this kind of this kind of uh, non closure this kind of, this kind of openness, right? So. Yeah, I mean um, <clears throat> the ontology that I'm proposing, the model, okay, uh, um, obviously claims to be true. So then it's both glasses and without glasses, right? That's that's truth. Truth, uh, true. Uh, I, this is just the transparency of truth, formally represented as p if and only if p is true. So that's the form it has. If 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 such and such is the case, you can you all you, you can the liar. Yeah. Well, that's the question. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You seem to have the liar, but you don't, because the liar defies this principle. So uh, uh, I think there's there's a good ad hoc solution to the liar, right? I mean, um, the liar is a formal problem. If uh, if truth is a formal property, you get the liar. That's correct. Explain uh, what the liar. Okay. The liar is this. Um, uh, uh, so here's the simple liar, okay, uh, here's a statement, let's call it statement, so the statement statement, and the statement statement says, this statement is false. Uh, if statement statement is true, it's false. If it's false, it's true. Okay, so now here you have, and uh, this means that it's not subject to your rule, P if and only if P is true, because here you have P if and only if P is not true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the, it means your model uh, is, to say the least, deeply incoherent. You have to do something, right? This doesn't come for free. You can't be like, eh, uh, uh, on a formal level. So if truth is, uh, if truth is a formal property, which is attractive, because then you can say, well, truth. The, the, Heidegger has a tendency to, to such a minimalism because Heidegger clearly doesn't want to say truth is correspondence between something in my head and something not in my head or between a language and something non-linguistic. He thinks this is all ridiculous. That's the idea of two realms and a bridge. Um, he calls this Schildbürgertum, uh, uh, for whatever reason. Okay, but uh, uh, um, it's odd, but, um, so, but, yeah, but that just won't do. Um, okay, so formally you get the liar if you have a purely formal theory of truth. Uh, 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 now what do you do? And I think, uh, I think Heidegger is well aware of this and uh, that's why he ge happily generates uh, paradoxes. Well, here's what I want to do. I think that uh, the formal concept of truth is a model for truth. Uh, uh, truth isn't a formal property. Truth is, uh, truth is the property that every true proposition and every fact, I, I, I don't think that truth is restricted to uh, uh, sentential structures. I think, you know, I think it's, it's a truth uh, that uh, Munich is in Bavaria, or it's a truth, and it was a truth. When the Big Bang happened, whatever that means, it was already a truth that the Big Bang is happening. Okay, so the truth has nothing to do with the existence of thought, sentences, utterances, etc. Well, it has nothing to do with an exaggeration because they can be true, but it's not limited to that. Well, I think I would not no, no, that's why he's an anti-realist. Yeah, that's exactly the why Heidegger is an anti-realist. Heidegger, Heidegger buys completely into what he rejects. Uh, Heidegger thinks 
only propositions can be true. He just has a funky view of propositions. He just thinks that they're only propositions because they're speakers. Yeah. And he grounds, uh, I, that's why I think Heidegger is just a correspondence theorist. Yeah. He grounds, however, he grounds correspondence in something that is not correspondence, in Dasein. Yeah. Which is why he wi winds up with an ambivalent yeah. theory of truth, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, exactly, he thinks it has, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so roughly that's the idea. So they're all the truth, okay? Or they're not all of them, okay? But they are truth. And now, now we can say, you know, what is it for something to be a truth? And then your answer is going to be a formal property. And this formal property, left by itself, would immediately be subject to the liar paradox as I deal with it. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but that's why I bring in non-formal restrictions on the explosion of the model. That's why I call my view realist. Uh, uh, and that's the deepest sense of realism to which I'm committed. Uh, that any interpretation of a formal symbolism will draw on non-formal material. Yeah. You want to Is this, uh, does from, this make from sense? From a Hegelian perspective to... to um, uh, I, well, yeah, I mean... As you wish. You can also go from up the debate. Uh, I'll just say one thing and then we can open up the debate. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, not, I, I, I'm not completely understanding uh, the distinction you're drawing between formal and non-formal okay. um, here. Uh, but maybe more more to the point, um, I think you know from from the phenomenal, I said broadly phenomenological perspective, uh, the you know the, the question for characterizing a phenomenon, right, such as such as truth, is not is it a, is it a formal property, is it a non-formal property? It's rather what is what is appearing, what is showing up, what's the structure of what's of what's showing up in this phenomenon, just as as such. And then I think to to deny you know that that there is a useful characterization of that um, is just you know, ultimately, again, there's no kind of getting around it to deny that there's such a thing as, as truth. Um, and so then you, you're maybe committed to that too, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, okay, okay, like, clearly, no, well, like, clearly in some versions of right, that, uh, yeah, in some versions, yeah. Uh, um, that, you know, like I give you like, the, the, uh, well, sorry, the, the, but then we can open this up, but maybe this is something that, uh, uh, that might be interesting for you. Let me just say like, I'm committed to like a theoretically Super enhanced, hopefully, version of the Netian heterophenomenology. Yeah. He has no idea what he's saying, but he got something. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. The, the, please uh, feel, also, fühlen Sie sich frei, seien Sie mutig. Uh, ich sehe Herr, Herr Weiß uh, sehr gut. Ich, ich muss dann das Mikro immer hin und her reichen. Yeah. Or maybe, I don't know. Uh, Paul also has a very strong voice, I think. Can, can, yeah, I, can yeah. everyone hear us? No? <laughs> okay. I, 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 I try it with the microphone. Okay. Yeah. okay, so thank you very much for the very interesting talk and the um, fascinating discussion. I have a question to um, something you mentioned earlier in your talk during your introduction. You referred to um, how can we make plausible Heidegger's version of realism and you refer to the problem of predication. Yeah. Um, well, this is a very interesting fact, I think. It's, and it's also kind of a, almost a standard maneuver in German philosophy that there's a problem with predication. Yeah. Then you somehow realize there is this surplus that makes predication possible at all. It's kind of a starting condition of uh, predication. And uh, then you start to wonder, how can we account for that? Or how can right. we access that? I think that this, is a, this is a fascinating tool of diagnosis that lots of philosophers in the German tradition of only Heidegger exploited. Um, and then they do something that I personally find absolutely terrible. They say we have to do a practical turn in some sense in order to access that. And I think you fall into some version of that, as you said, you refer to like this type of practical holism um, of, that Heidegger pursues, and you, you refer to, to the idea of a life form, and you quoted Wittgenstein. And so I'm personally, I'm deeply skeptical of the idea yeah. that this type of pra practical turn can really help us with this mysterious surplus that we discovered by means of um, theoretical problems of predication. But obviously you do. So could you elaborate a bit on why you're convinced by this? Yeah. Um, Klar, Klar. Yeah. So, okay. So actually, um, I'm not um, convinced by the practical, what you call the practical turn. Um, even though uh, you're quite right, I'm using resources uh, such as the terminology of Wittgenstein, the latent form, 
um, and also of Heidegger's references to a, a holism. Um, but I, uh, and this is you know more fully developed in the book, uh, I don't mean to, by that to suggest anything that um, has an exclusively or even primarily practical, uh, uh, you know, uh, humble, uh, kind of significance. Um, what I mean is is a something like a much much closer, I think, to to um, to the fields of sense. Uh, something like a, a context of a possible a possible disclosure, um, and um, I don't mean to sort of say that it's it's all just a question of kind of um, you know in, instituted practices or something 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 along the, along those lines. Uh, as for the, the the problem of predication, though, right? Uh, I do think that this is um, a problem. This is a real problem. And actually, I would locate its origin not, you know, kind of in, in 20th century philosophy of language or recent German philosophy or anything like that, but actually in Plato. Uh, so we just go to the sophist, and, and in the sophist we have this discussion of, uh, of the uh, the possibility of, of uh, admitting motion, change, time, and becoming into into being itself uh, over against the Eleatic position, the position of Parmenides. Um, that uh, you know that time and motion change don't don't exist, and this is answered actually with the first appeal to something like a structure of predication. It, change is possible because it is possible to say something about something, uh, and not simply to have a simple sort of uh, you know kind of one uh, uh, un 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 univocally determined uh, just say just uh, the legain is the legain of tinos. It's about it's something about something, um, and so so this is an old problem. And um, you know, Plato certainly is not answering it by means of a, of a pragmatism or a theory of practice. Um, and I think Heidegger, reading the Sophist in those lectures, also is not is not answering it in, in that way. Uh, he'll refer to herme hermeneutic conditions, conditions of the interpretability of a world, um, and of course, famously in being in time, he'll emphasize some of the, the practical um, dimensions of that of that hermeneutic. Um, Interpretation, but I don't think there's anything that that makes it have to be about about practices exclusively or, or primarily. Ja, wir haben noch ein paar Minuten. Äh, wer möchte noch sich beteiligen? Äh, nur gut, äh, es sind auch einige Studenten der Hochschule, die noch Seminare zum Thema belegen. <lacht> This is just an idea which came to my mind. Um, I want to question why. Like the basic structure of the world of truth has to be in every way paradoxical. Mm -hmm. Like when Heidegger is saying that the world is open or unveiled, it just means it's open for our interpretation. We can interpret what's coming upon us in the world. And I think he's stepping that line in line in a line of thought which he's himself tracing back to antiquity, that the world is open for us for interpretation. Yes. And this is basically the thought of Aristotle. Prima materia, that the world in itself is being able to be determined, and I don't. And I think that Aristotle was very similar to Heidegger, and the only difference I see is Heidegger saying, "But this in itself paradoxical," and I don't understand why, because Aristotle would say the world is being determinable, and then we can say a little bit about the basic principle of determination, yeah. and just. Uh, Professor Gabriel, you very often mention your, your example of making a list of the world, and the world doesn't exist because we can't make a list of the world. And I think Aristotle would say, well, the world is the paper you're writing, so the, the possibility of making a list. And what is Heidegger's argument to say this is paradoxical, but this is not consistent? <laughs> So yeah, I would say you're right. Uh, the basic thing for Heidegger's Aristotle is that it's open for interpretation. Um, but there, we say so we can say a bit more than that, um, and and we should say a bit more than that. It particularly in uh, if we want to uh, follow in some way Heidegger's question, which is about being, which is about the, the being of beings. Um, and in particular, then we can say, well, interpretation. I mean, yes, interpretation is open. Interpretation is uh, with Aristotle's simply potentiality. But does this potentiality? Have a structure. Does it? Does it? Is it characterizable in some in some way? Obviously, and to say, of course, that the world is open to interpretation does not mean we can interpret it just any way that we want. Um, so this is where I think I think Heidegger really is appealing to the specific structure of truth and its relationship to ontological difference. That is, to the to 
the difference between being being and beings. Um, and that gives, you know, I just try to sketch, you know, kind of for broad formal terms in which that that is sufficient actually to give us a, 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 a set of paradoxes around around uh, totality and determinability. And if one wanted to read these issues back into Aristotle, into his conception of potentiality, I think one could one could do so, um, and you know, find that that, that that conception of the you know the, the writing pad <laughs> the, the, the blank is, is paradoxical in a similar fashion. Yeah, so, yeah, just a word on uh, Aristotle and why there are paradoxes, because I think Aristotle is just so incredibly ignorant, he has no clue. I mean, he thinks there's like stuff on Earth and some stuff falls down, and then there's a lunar sphere and a dude behind it, God, and 55 spheres and stuff. Like, if, if this is your knowledge of reality, then of course it's much easier to say, well, things are disclosed, right? I mean, so this is just a function of utter ignorance. I mean, also they have terrible mathematics degree. So, like, this is, I think, this is, you know, of course it's easier to talk about cosmos. Not very good yeah. logic yeah. And they have terrible logic. I mean, so, like, uh, I mean, it's an amazing advanced achievement, right? I mean, under those conditions. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, but clearly, under those conditions, you're more, way more likely to think of reality as a sphere surrounding you without asking the question, you know, but where does the sphere exist, right? Because you're not even equipped with the logical tools to kind of formulate this version of a worry. Huh? Um, it's, it's kind of there, like, uh, pre-consciously in Plato, clearly, much less so in Aristotle. Huh? Uh, uh, that's, that's part of, of what, you know, the tradition has perceived as this empiricism. Huh? Uh, but I think this just means that, that he's, you know, in an interesting way, I mean, this is not just a critic, in an interesting, more ignorant than Plato, because at least he's trying to figure out how things are, and Plato isn't, you know. Uh, on this level, so, uh, but yeah, that's why, but on, on, on the, you know, what you talk about, you know, I think it's an epistemological issue, yeah, right, I mean, so, Aristotle has interesting things to say, regardless of it, his empirical ignorance, uh, he has very interesting things to say about the question, and this is what, uh, why Heidegger goes back to Aristotle uh, in this interpretation of truth, of course, as you know, right, um, uh, you know, what is it to be in touch with how things are, right, and, uh, uh, um, uh, and you might say, you know, to use your metaphor, right, if I make a list of what there is, right, tables and cars and whatever, and I write this down, and then you might say, well, there's, now metaphorically, there's, of course, a paper on which I write this down. Well, yeah, I agree, right, I mean, need, there need be a paper, I can imagine the list, I can write it on my notebook, and so on. Yeah. Um, but that's just saying, look, something is real. Yeah. I'm clearly saying that. I'm a realist in all departments, as Davidson once called himself for very different reasons, but I just used this, I like the sentence to be a realist in all departments, and, uh, uh, but that means also that, yeah, no, clearly, that uh, lots of things are real. I'm, uh, 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 there's no, I try not to have anything in my view which makes it likely to sound like, as if it had any constructivist or uh, obvious idealist sympathies. Uh, so, uh, I'm not denying in any way whatsoever that, for instance, Munich is real, or I'm really here, etc., etc. Yeah. But when I say what this means, right, so when I give an account of what it is for me to be really here, I will not want to mention a totality, yeah, right? I mean, it's tempting to say what it means for me to be here is for me to be one of those things that there are, right? Me, the moon, you, the past. Yeah. But that's, I think, a wrong answer. Yeah. So I think I agree with you also. Also, I think you're you're restricted, you attained Aristotle, regardless of the, part, the, you know, the, the bit that you obviously didn't commit to is natural science or whatever, right? So I think your restricted bit is fine as it stands. Uh, 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 but I think, you, I think you can't avoid the paradoxes by just stating the correct epistemological realism. I think once you then ask the question, but what is it, right, uh, for the world now in your sense as what is the close to be? then you will have to choose minimally between Paul's and my model and probably other models. I think in that sense metaphysics is inevitable in that sense of metaphysics. But, and with respect to Aristotle, even if, we ask, the answer? even if we ask, I would say, you know, about the being of potentiality, if we ask what is it fundamentally to be a, poten to, to be a potentiality or dunamis, um, then we'll get into the same yeah. area. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's something that Heidegger saw, right? If you look at his various readings of Metaphysics Theta 10, right? Uh, 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 which is always his reference text for his account of truth, next to uh, you know, some bits, of, uh, bits and pieces from 
uh, other uh, passages, then I think he's clearly trying to show, right, Aristotle has to say something about totality in a way extremely uncomfortable for him. I think this is, this is part of his reading. Yeah. Otherwise, he would just be an Aristotelian. I think this is where Heidegger is not nostalgic. Often there's the idea, well, isn't Heidegger saying we should all be good Greeks? I think he's not this kind of German. Uh, um, he's more like a Schäuble kind of German. The, the Greeks are like, okay, but look, they need a lot of modern discipline and blah, blah, blah. I think this is more the style of the argument. Uh, he's not nostalgic. Wir haben halb neun, ich würde sagen, es war auch geplant. Sie haben heute einige Fragen, wahrscheinlich noch, also morgen und übermorgen gibt es die Antworten, nämlich aus der, auf der Konferenz kommt in der Realism, in der, der Hochschule für Philosophie. Um neun Uhr geht es los. Ihnen beiden, euch beiden nochmal vielen Dank. Es war eine tolle Veranstaltung, sowohl der Input als auch wirklich die Diskussion, die ging, glaube ich, wirklich zu den großen Fragen der abendländischen Philosophie. Und ich wünsche euch einen schönen Abend und Ihnen natürlich auch. Vielleicht sehen wir uns morgen. Vielen Dank.